everybody. We're running behind. As normal, welcome to In Production. My focus, we can't totally tell. This is uh, our live stream for the craft show community and uh, creatives. And even if you're not a craft show person per se, you're a human being. And so we welcome you to Hopefully our show. Looks being. a little dark in here, doesn't it? It does look a little dark. It's a little moody up in here today. We got a little. We got moody. Got a little mood happening. Maybe my screen is on this laptop. Nope. No. <laughs> it's pretty moody. <laughs> Yep, we're it's, just moody people it's today. It's a little moody. It's a up little in bit here moody. on a Tuesday. So how's everybody doing? Um, you know, interesting stuff has happened since last we spoke. Uh, we posted an HDR tutorial video that pissed people off because we called it part one, but it wasn't the whole tutorial. It's kind of like when you see a trailer. I wonder if people get pissed off when they see a trailer. They do. Yeah, and they're like, "Where's the whole movie?" Well, it they was do. like a trailer. We just wanted to go a little bit different approach. Um, the idea was to show the entire video in HDR and go backwards. Lots of discussions were had. MPEG is here. I can see that. Is that correct? Yep. Ichimoto is here. I can see yep. that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Guys, if you're not part of the super secret GH5 pro user Ninja Force baby seal squashing, Dr. Pepper drinking, mosaic hop loving creative group, there you're you missing out on the some of the best. Group. Like, I could actually ask a question <coughs> that if I would have asked in any other GH5 user group, I would have been destroyed. Or any other, not just GH5, oh. any other production group. Like the question you asked last night? Yeah, yeah. about the Sigma Art 18 to 34 yeah. million. Um, I haven't used an electronic lens in a very, very, it's since the 90s. Do you realize that? It's been a while. I just don't like them, so I don't know what I'm years. doing with them. So it's I been think a, while. a lot has changed since the last time. Yeah, <laughs> probably. I think it was I think it was actually the early two thousands, but still, like it's been a long time since I've used an electronic lens and I got actually wonderful feedback from wonderful human beings. Yeah, it looked like you did actually. Yeah, I mean I got good feedback. Like, feedback from people who I would consider to be more uh, camera owner operator like shooters yeah. than anything else. Um, it was great. I agree. So beers today, we it's got a, a little group. mix up. I'm drinking Founders Mosaic Promise, a single hop ale with uh, it looks like Jean Grey on it. I can, Ooh, you probably Jean can't Grey. see that. It looks like a little bit of a Jean Grey there on there. Go. It's tasty beer, and Jeff is drinking I've got a Wind Fox Ridge. urine. <laughs> Wind Ridge Fox urine. <laughs> don't make me spell it. It's a mosaic rye ale. I, we list. try to organize everything. If you guys don't know what's going on, if there's stuff you're looking for, we try to reorganize everything into the camera department, which is all camera production-related stuff, yeah. the writer's room, which is pre-pro or development or anything in that space, yeah. and then we have the post uh, house, which is all focused on nothing but... Um, post production, but mostly been color oriented. Based on time. YouTube, no one gives a shittle about the writers' room. I'll tell you that much. Just being candid, no one cares about the story. I don't. Everyone either. says they care about the story because it's trendy to say you care about the story, but in reality, when you post something about story, no one cares. I do. I just want somebody else to do it for me. Well, that's, that's why a fair I enough was not in the, That's a fair enough straight. No, I think that's no. Totally it's easy. just because I'm I'm not that good at telling stories in that aspect. Yeah. All right, so enough shenanigans on today's yeah. show. Let's talk what about what show? we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a couple of things. One, we're going to talk about 8K workflow on YouTube because it can be done, and more importantly, it can be done using a GH5 in anamorphic mode. We've tested it. In fact, if I can pull the clip up, I'm still rendering. <laughs> it's a nine-and-a-half-minute episode that has been rendering now for five hours, and it looks like... It will be close to what I tell you was uh, 11 gigs, H.265 yeah. at 11 gigs. So 8K is like the beast mode of beast modes. And we're actually starting to experiment with 8K HDR, which is really irrelevant because no one can see it. Yeah. It's For really an American point. moment. We're just wanting to see it. Those yeah. outside of America, it's this America. is the supersized yeah. French fry moment, right? 8K YouTube is, is supersized French fries because you, uh, unless you're out of America, you can't or have the money to afford one of those tellies. You can't you can't take advantage of it, but yeah. it is an argument for future proofing. It's an argument for hey, let's see how far we can go with it. Uh, it's an argument for American excess, uh, yeah, not success, excess. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to talk about that. So we're going to a little preview of some footage. Um, some of it might look familiar, but you've not seen some of these angles and yeah. different perspectives. And Jeff got to grade it in SDR. Yeah, which it looks fantastic. It's fun. It's not HDR finally. So that'll be in there. It'll get dropped twice. Uh, you'll see it here once. We're also going to talk about cinematic tone and kind of approach. And the reason we want to talk about that is a couple of, of actually reasons. Um, the big one is 
you know, just looking around and asking about lenses, and I watched a bunch of reviews on lenses, because if you guys don't know, I was asking, and I'd love to ask it in this group, and we'll sidebar that. Hold your answers for this question in a second, but I was asking about the uh, Sigma Art 18-35, to the, uh -huh. fo the uh, photo versus the cine styles. And so we had that conversation, and I asked about it, and it, when I did my pre-research, the baby seal troll force of research that I came across... Most of it was like people talking about cinematic. It's, oh, it's so cinematic, it's cinematic, cinematic, cinematic. And digging into it and, you know, what's cinematic to me is not necessarily cinematic to another person. Uh, I see a lot of long lens bokeh shots and those are called cinematic. And to me, that's not necessarily the case. I think a close-up is cinematic in, in certain usage. But just throwing up bokeh and making everything look out of focus in the background is not cinematic to me. We've talked about that before. What I did yeah. find, though, was... I saw some footage from Newman Films, and you guys probably all know Newman Films, who mm -hmm. they are. And they had some uh, work with one of the primes on that. And he had an absolutely beautifully composed uh, frame. And Ichimoto, I'm not going to like praise you too much, but you do have the same effect, which is a nice medium-wide shot where the background's not completely gone bokeh. It's still retaining some quality of texture, and the, the subject has been separated. That's the level of cinema that is cinematic to me. I'm more drawn to those shots than I am mm -hmm. close-up shots. Now, again, it's preference, but the biggest it thing is. about it is something we wanted to discuss with this group because it's not camera-specific. This is for anybody involved. Yeah. Hell, I've seen some iPhone stuff that I've seen some shots Jeff took with his cell phone that were like truly, to me, cinematic. If they were moving or yeah. in any other space, they felt epic. So but I think framing stills. is a big part of it that people don't yeah, talk I about. I think so. Framing is a big part of it to me. Right. Which has nothing to do with the lens except for the, the, the value of the lens. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, it comes down to composition, right? It Which does. is a whole lot of stuff. So we're going to talk about that. And then probably, you know, the typical same old, we, we talk too long shenanigans. All right, so there you go. Uh, so that's 1080 footage. Um, I went with really simple titles just because I like sometimes those really plain, simple yeah. titles. It's not about anything more than the content. So that was 1080 footage. Obviously, it's 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 converted down from 8K. That raw yeah. file, as you saw, was one minute, 17 seconds, or 19 yeah. seconds, I think, with the tail on it. it um, how many was it? How many gigs? 38 gigs. It was 38 gigabytes for that file. One minute and 17 seconds, 19 seconds, sorry. One minute, 19 seconds was a whopping 38 plus gigabytes massive stuff and so you're talking about 8k is a major thing so the workflow on that 8k alone is is fairly problematic i'm going to pop the uh, chat up so we can talk about it it's really problematic really challenging and really brutal mm -hmm. um there's a bunch of uh there's a bunch of craft show things in there i don't know if you've hit them all up yet but just to yeah, get to those i'm getting some um, yeah, so obviously that some of that's heirloom. Those are B shots from heirloom that didn't make it that we wanted to use. They were alternate takes, whatever it was, and we just wanted to make a little piece that wasn't heirloom related. It's just a guy going on a walk, and he just decides to climb up to a waterfall. I don't really care. It doesn't really matter. Do any of those films ever make sense? No, not to me. They all look like the same thing. Cool music, throw some players, pretty picture. There you go. But the SCR grade in that's fantastic. I've seen the HDR version as well. It looks really good. But that is in the 8K. So the pipeline to do that work... Uh, does require a, a, a good bit of work. So since this group is somewhat GH5-centric, it would apply to any camera that could match the frame size. 
Um, but obviously the way to do that is to use 6K high-res anamorphic, uh, which outputs a frame size of uh, 7680 by 4320 in the anamorphic. And then when you de-squeeze, uh, I'm sorry, it, it's bigger than that. I, actually, I'm wrong. It's bigger than that. The YouTube 8K yeah. is 7680 by 4320. So yeah. you actually have room inside that. Jeff cropped that to 240. Is that right? Yes. So it's that was cropped to 240. Yes. But if you go to 100, 2.40. it's it's you you can zoom in. Like you have to back yeah. out the image. The image is larger than YouTube 8K. You actually have to shrink it down uh, on the timeline or in DaVinci. You have to conform it down uh, to fit. And on in Premiere terms, if 100 is the full frame size, you have all the way up to about 77. And I'll say all that, and I'll walk you through how we do the process because it is. It is important you're not going to cut the negative. You can. You can try and cut the raw negative, but your machine's going to chug. So we go through the process of how to not worry about cutting the raw negative. And something that we found out that I can tell you in this video after we did a test that because we pre-recorded those obviously yesterday and today. But in this, I can tell you that is as long as when you get to the post side, you make sure that color 2020 primaries button is clicked, which will make sense when you watch the video then you can actually take Rec. 709 footage and throw it up in 8K. You can also scale stuff up. Don't be afraid to do it. I mean, scale stuff up like a champ. But like guys like Ichi, dude, it, just go for it. Like you already mm -hmm. have the anamorphic glass. Anybody that's got some anamorphic glass or rent some, shoot the 6K. It's a little bit of a pain. We know it's harder, but the payout, if you want to see that crazy resolution, if you even see the value in it, again, it's more about forward thinking than it is anything else. Uh, it is pixel peeping to the extreme. It is uh, supersized french fries from McDonald's. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, a 4,000 calorie meal from a fast food joint. That's yeah. what it is. But it serves a purpose if you're hungry for that need. So uh, the 8K on the grading technical side, can you even start to talk about the nightmare that that becomes, like, some of the challenges in it's it? It's a chug fest. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's mostly computer spec problematic uh, in that aspect. You have to have a graphics card of some sort to be able to push it a little bit. Uh, you have to have a dongle. You have to do DaVinci Studio because uh, you have to customize the size. Right. Uh, which is larger than any default DaVinci rendering. Um, yeah, and my GPU lights up every time that we switch it to 8K. Well, when we first did tests, we actually overheated Jeff's yeah. iMac. Um, to a point it shut down. We got an alarm. Yeah. Like an audible alarm. First alarm that I've ever said that GPU overheated. The GPU, yeah. We fry, We In nearly DaVinci. fried his iMac. Never heard, never seen that. I've seen GPU full before, but never seen DaVinci pop up one that says GPU overheated. And it was, it, that, but the, the catch to that is it was terrifying because we were quite literally in the middle of, of doing heirloom we were yeah. testing for like delivery testing not yeah. like sh shot testing delivery testing yeah. and it we i thought we had fried his computer i mean it completely locked up and shut down for a period of time we had to let it cool yeah which was crazy so yeah. it's beefy it is the it's upper a very end. beefy thing yeah I mean, you're not going to get a macbook pro well you could graphic. offline it the yeah. way we talk about you can you do could. the offline trick or if you're cool enough to have a render farm right uh which we might have a couple of people in here that have render farms. Yeah. That could process. Right. But, um, yeah. And it's Peg, that's my new my favorite quote, not quote one of my bro. Favorite you are a, peep, <laughs> you're a pixel stalker. That's amazing. I love it. That's going to go uh, on the sticker list. He said go PC to MPEG. And uh, MPEG, I'm actually working out trying to build a Linux system. Yeah, but there's an issue that we came across from DaVinci. There's, there's a lot a of rumored issues issue. with it. Yeah, yeah, a rumored issue. And that's 265, right? Uh, yes. So the rumor is that, that from alleged tech that DaVinci doesn't decode 265 correctly outside of Mac world? Yeah. So Supposedly. Supposedly. We don't have a PC to test it on. If anybody has a PC and has decoded successfully yeah. with a full version of DaVinci, I don't know about the the uh, other version. The other version won't do it. Yeah. Um, you guys are skilled. Oh, thanks, Max. I have a MacBook Pro 15, had to revert back to Yosemite. Yeah, dude, I, I'm with you. I saw when you went through all that stuff, E.G., like, yeah. E.G. upgraded it, and, and, and it fell apart. We <laughs> we have a rule, like, we don't upgrade. Like, if we're going to upgrade or update any of our OS, it'll be in December when most, for our business, most yeah. of the time, advertising slows down, and our film work can slow down, and we can kind of control the projects. Then we'll update, and 
usually we're still like two versions or a version behind. Right now we're two behind. Yeah, we're we'll two. We're both on Captains. Actually, yeah. we still got hit Sierra before we hit High Sierra. Right. Even though I can't confirm that on my computer because MPEG might bring this up, <laughs> that uh, DaVinci 14.1 is working on a El Capitan. Right. Yeah, if you can test the uh, MPEG, if you could test that, that yeah, would be, that'd be amazing. Because awesome. we've, we've not gotten it to confirm one way or the other uh, on how it's going to do it. Craft Show, Sharp is coming out with an 8K camera. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. Uh, and there's 8K displays, but the price point on them is ridiculous right yeah. now. Yeah. Their camera's not terribly bad looking, but I did see a meme that it was if you want a red, but you bought it at Walmart. And that was <laughs> oh, my God. That's amazing. That was the that's Sharp That's a troll force moment. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely amazing. Um, so they're asking about Linux distro. Yeah, uh, none yet, Scott R. I'm still researching. My uh, father-in-law is a big Linux IT guy who's, uh, I will have to have a major large discussion with, and probably with this community too when I start actually really looking into it. The biggest thing about the Linux box that's fascinating to me from a post side isn't stability, isn't anything more than I can then format DCP drives correctly. Yeah. So when you're when you're pumping out a, a you can make a DCP absolutely all day you want yeah. on Mac or PC or mm -hmm. Linux, but the reality is the drive needs to be uh, formatted into I can't remember what it is now it's been a yeah. while but it has to be formatted into a very specific Linux uh, doodad. Uh, I went through the process did that I did it myself uh -huh. I, I made a complete DCP of a feature you did uh, Sons of Liberty completely done by hand. I'll never do it again. I will pay someone else to do it because the Linux portion of that, I had like like three computers booting in different flavors and I had I mean it was so much work just to get the files and the and the hard drive formatted correctly. In the future, I'll just send it to someone and be like, "Here's the picture lock, make a DCP, moving on with life." Yeah. I was trying to save money and there's times where saving money doesn't really benefit you. I wasted so much time and and effort on Yeah, it with a DCP, I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't. I would just let somebody else deal with yeah. it. Yeah. Somebody that's qualified yeah. to deal with it. The GH5 just found a niche that needed filled, and a lot of people fell in love for 2K. No, that's my point. $2,000, $2,000, sub $2,000 camera, mm -hmm. technically, uh, once you add gimmicks. And we uploaded an 8K image. So if you want to argue future proofing, it's there. You're going to yeah. have to get an anamorphic lens, though. I did test it, and we'll see how it looks. But I did take a 4.3 image, shot at 6K high res anamorphic, and then reframed it on an 8K timeline. Um, you just have to do the math mm -hmm. on calculating what your actual lenses are going to yeah. be because it gets really tricky really quick. Um, and you're blowing the image up essentially, but not really because you're shrunk down. It's really weird. It's a really weird yeah. process. Um, yeah. Yeah, the transcoding is a big part of the process. Very um, much so. Each is saying the transcoding didn't work. That's interesting. Yeah, it didn't work for him. I remember seeing that on his thing. Yeah, there's no way that like for us, I do it all the time. We use Edit Ready. Uh, some people love it. Some people hate it. Edit Ready works really well for us. We've mm -hmm. endorsed it, um, not from a paid side, but just from a production house side. We've used it. Yeah, it, it built us out for the HDR heirloom. Yeah, I mean it really With did. Those 265s, it really and we were transcoding. Saved we were transcoding. We started us. using Edit Ready as our kit, so we'll transcode on the fly. Um, MPEG was saying that he uploads the Avid DNX HR files. That's the, been the best way we've seen to do it. The yeah, 265 encode of yeah. whatever it is, and you have to use hybrid, um, and hybrid's a whole other process. Don't worry. That part of the video is coming. Uh, that tutorial will be there. We just have to roll it out installments, not for fucking, whoops, not for channel views. I know I dropped an F-bomb. Not for channel wow. views, not for anything more than the, the simple, I'm passionate about it, the simple fact oh, that no. It is a lot of a process. It is not just one video step. It is not a click button, yeah. suddenly HDR content, with the exception of if you can do the Avid portion. And we'll talk about that. But if you really need to compress the frame size, then we do have to sit down and have a conversation about how you got to work through hybrid. Yeah. Um, because Media Encoder does not support it, so Premiere is not supporting it, allegedly Final Cut will soon enough. Yeah. But until we get our hands on it to test it, I can't endorse, I can only go with the workflow that I know worked. And the reason yep. I say that is because we sell that to our clients. That's something we do sell. Yeah. We sell HDR as an upgrade. We've had clients buy it. We uh -huh. have two of them in the hole right now that we're waiting to have them sign off so we can prep for that. Yeah. So we deliver content in HDR because our clients want it. The bigger issue we're still having is YouTube changed something, and it looks like they're about to change something again on December 14th. And in the process of changing that, they changed how the SDR LUTs are, this, the sidecar, the yeah. ride-along is what I call it. The ride-along is working. So 
Jeff thinks we might have solved it, but yeah, it's been a nightmare. It's been a very big nightmare. So if anybody's looking at it, you know, since you can't dual stream it, it gets to be a very problematic issue. Yeah. Boys and girls from around the world love. That's what she said. And I know I've changed the title of That's What She Said multiple times, but today, That's What She Said is going to be back to what it originally was meant to be, which was a shameless channel plug for somebody of our community. And uh -huh. uh, I don't know how much he watches live. I do know he watches a good bit. And he's actually a wealth of knowledge and a very positive human being, so he gets a little plug. Though his YouTube channel does not have his name in the YouTube channel. Like, he hasn't done the whole, like changed his name over but that's going to belong to our good friend victor bart aka retro oh. machines on youtube victor is super nice he is a gh5 owner user he's a multi-camera owner user he's just a really good guy and i just wanted to shout him out so if you look for retro machines on youtube you can find victor uh i don't know exactly where he's from but um he oh, no. does always end up with some really cool content for the most part um, some of it is computer stuff and it's completely over my head, but he's a really great guy and worth the support. He's got a new video he dropped, like a little trip he took. It's got some cool harrowing moments in it, like some really fun mm -hmm. kind of vloggy type stuff. Really great fellow. Love Victor. Great guy. All right. That's the end of that. Comments back up. Yeah. I know what that's I'm doing. With it. All right. So let's talk about getting cinematic. So we've had a couple of questions pop through the pipeline. Already, somebody asked about Beyond 8K, and I'm going to relate that to cinematic because I don't think frame size has anything to do with cinematic, and that's not what I was implying. Uh, the 8K thing, and the reason we wanted to test it, is just the idea that somewhere down the road, that effect will alter uh, the Marshall McLuhan effect of uh, the medium is the message, right? You will have your brain altered, uh, your eyesight will be altered based on the imagery that's coming in. Mm -hmm. Fair enough? I mean, it's the same idea as Susan Sontag with to take a picture yeah. and limit someone's words, and, and that's paraphrasing. But if, if we are going to take pictures, and in our case, most of us are motion picture uh, aficionados or professionals or whatever, mm -hmm. we are going to essentially run into that. HDR has already changed the landscape visually yeah. for you and I. It has. Uh, I find it too sharp, less cinematic. But that's where the world is going. And it there's is been too sharp. great conversations about 60 frames per second and how that feels like what people are experiencing on video games and on their mm -hmm. phones, and so that's what they're they're looking to see films in. Great. That's all a personal preference thing, but we do need to do it, because at the end yeah. of the day, I may not deliver my own personal project, 60 frames a second, 850K. 48 frames a second. Yeah, I'm going to stay 24, and I'm going to stay 4K for now, because that's where I'm happiest. Yeah. But there are people that may want that going forward, so I think the 8K, beyond 8K... Uh, they will, I think it'll jump. It should go to 16 next. It really should just, just double over, which is just going to be resolution that we may or may not ever see in a television, to be yeah. honest with you. That's going to be like projector stuff. Yeah. Until it's holographic or something really insane, which that data does exist. Then someone else was bringing up a great point. I think it might have been Eggpeg, MPEG that said uh, 60 frames a second cinematic. Uh, I think that's what I was talking about. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a preference thing. I don't know if it's 60 is cinematic or not. To me... Um, I personally don't like it because it looks like a soap opera or the old soap opera effect. It looks like live sports yeah. to me. And I like the fact that sports uh, in the live presentation look mm -hmm. live and in the 30 on 30 presentation look a little more cinematic. Yeah. NFL films is my jam when they used to shoot on film. Yeah. Now they yeah. should be the called M NFL videos. Yeah. But when I they agree. shot on film, I used to love to watch it because then suddenly you had that music and that voice uh -huh. and... The narration and the NFL and the shots were always insane and a great slow mo on film. You knew that Yo. that shot cost them twelve thousand dollars, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. So it, part of it is that, so right? So that's cinematic. I, I don't think we can ever really define it. I don't think it is a definable term. That's just a personal opinion. But what I do think is interesting is approach. And what I wanted to show was two things real quick, um, with a third that's going to parlay over nicely. But the first one, I we had a chance on, on a project called Ether. I would call it the most cinematic project that Jeff and I got to do, uh, supported by Scott Robinson. I don't know if Scott's watching. Um, yeah, I haven't seen him today. Yeah, he's probably busy. He's in L.A. But he's probably at launch. But Scott helped it. And, and the thing about this uh, was that we had incredible talent. So the first interview we get to see is a guy named David L. Snyder. And David has done tons of movies. They'll flash his names at the end. Yeah. 
but the, and they're, these are short, but what's really killer about, listen to what he's talking about, listen to his origin story, where he came from, it's a source of inspiration, it's also where he started finding his own cinematic image. I did ask him about the seashell, if you don't know what that means, you will shortly, but let's check out this little quick little clip from David L. Snyder, and I'll talk more about the project momentarily, if I can figure out how to do all these buttons at one mm -hmm. time, what a cluster change. My name is David L. Snyder. When uh, I was first uh, approached by Scott Robinson to do the film, uh, he said, we're gonna send me the four pages for the prologue. And he did, and I said, you know what? You're gonna, you're gonna have to send me the whole script because I, I have to know more. This is just fun. This is, this is gonna be a lot of fun. I guess my start in the industry was my uh, family, my mother's family business was uh, masonry contracting, brick laying, stone cutting laying. And uh, I uh, took an interest in it because my uncle uh, had a drawing table. I met a guy who was an art director in television uh, during a, an era of lots of variety shows like Sonny and Cher and uh, the Smothers Brothers and uh, the Carol Burnett Show. There, there, were, there were like probably 12 variety shows on television a week. So I started to do that and, and I had no notion that I'd ever be allowed to work in the movies, which I frequented and, and, and I loved, but it never occurred to me that that was a step in that direction. So uh, through another series of circumstances, and it had to do with uh, the way that Hollywood was organized at the time with unions and all that, uh, the studios had to make an agreement uh, through, a, through a, a federal court decision that uh, it was part of the Taft-Hartley Act, and they said, okay, if you work for 30 days, you can get in the industry. So that was my break. Uh, I had the skills that I had not known because I had worked in architecture, graphic design, toy design. I was a musician. I did lots of things. And I was about 30 years old, and I thought I had failed at all of them. And then all of a sudden, like some epiphany, it all came together that I had been trained without my knowledge to be a motion picture art director. With everything I've seen so far, uh, and, and being informed that, oh wait, you haven't seen nothing yet, this is, we've got even more stuff to show you, I think it's gonna be an amazing venture. All right, so a little bit of that shameless plug for something we did, but you can see the guy's yeah. credit. So he has a he has a Oscar nomination for uh, art direction on Blade Runner. Yeah. And David Real recently, person. yeah, David and I stay in contact, uh, very nice guy. Um, you got a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. You could kind of see we had big set pieces. I mean, it was huge production. Um, it was. It, it was. It was a lot of cinematic moments. Like we had nice wide shots, some close up shots, crazy camera moves. Yeah. It was all about composition. But some of the stuff changed. So even the cinematic, the approach to the mm -hmm. cinematic shifted throughout the process. Let's pop these up. Sorry, guys. Uh, shifted throughout the process. In fact, at one point, uh, the color grade, for example. Yeah. How many shifted versions completely. of the color grade did we go through? Oh, uh, we did quite a few color grades on it. Yeah. Uh, at one point, so, we had a little more Mad Max. Yeah, started very Mad Max. Yeah. And then we realized that was too uh, much, and we backed yeah. it off. And yeah. And then we had the, uh, the spot where Phil Forno was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the that Bruin was, area was yeah. that green sort of. That was a weird, heavy green thing that turned into a less green, but still green. Uh, different kind of nasty mood to it. No, that that guy is from the original Blade Runner. Yeah, he's from the original. Blade and Runner. he told us stories about Ridley Scott. And if I yeah. can ever get him, he'll do an interview. If I can get him somehow okay. figure out how to do a live thing, we will chat with David. And, and, are you talking about film school? Like the guy will teach you more about production than you've ever wanted to know in your entire life. But but the funny thing about that story and that film, and you can find it online, it's called Ether. You can find that short online and, and watch it and see how we did it. That was shot on red, in case anyone's asking. Mm -hmm. But um, the funniest thing about that was not only did we have David on that, we also had this fellow. Let me kill the uh, comments momentarily. We also had this guy who has three Oscars. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Funky, and uh, I'm a cinematographer on Ether Prologue, a fantastic mix of steampunk, futurism, alternate universe. It's quite exciting to be here because we've got a little bit of everything in the story. 
Yeah, I moved to New Zealand in 1999 to start up the miniatures unit for The Lord of the Rings because they'd really never done any miniature photography in New Zealand up until that time. Uh, when I started work in 1999 on The Lord of the Rings, there were no facilities, no stages, no equipment, so everything had to be built. Stages had to be created and pressurized, motion control rigs had to be built from scratch, basically. We built it all, and then we proceeded to shoot for several years. Um, that was an amazing project because it was, a, it was a combination of so many passions, so many people who were excited and thrilled about that story and making that film. What we had to do was look at Peter Jackson's vision and his style and his handwriting, as it were, and then adapt the techniques that we used in miniature photography to specifically uh, en envelop his vision because he had some very specific ideas about how miniatures were used and how they, and how they worked and so forth. We very quickly learned what we had to do because we had uh, over a thousand sets. It's something that will never happen again. It was, uh, many people call it the Holy Grail and it really was that. All right, so there you go. There's Alex, um, Uncle Alex as we all call him, uh, one of the most caring, giving, amazing human beings like David. Uh, super pedigree 3000 the guy has mad skills in the business as a mm -hmm. cinematographer um, he is an ASC member um, he, he has three Oscars uh, two for Lord of the Rings one for Total Recall the original um, and so Alex really knows visual effects and this had some VFX yeah. in it and Alex is, is just a delightful guy so we really put that together for a reason is that we wanted to make sure that we are trying to achieve maximum cinematic production value as much as possible yeah right and so to those elements the approach was find people that are going to help elevate your production in that yeah. if you're a one-man show fine or one woman show one person show I get it try and find locations that help elevate but it's always mm -hmm. thinking about how you can elevate the production to the next level and really push your, your story forward it's all about pushing your story forward yes that is correct but it's the combination of all these elements to lift it up to do that so bring in people if you have a chance that are more experienced than you if you're DPing yeah. something find an amazing gaffer oh, just yeah. reach out Definitely. see if there's a gaffer that will do you a favor if you really need it or if it's a paid job and you're lucky enough get them to pay for a great gaffer yeah have them or key grip if you're going to be doing a lot of camera movement stuff just get somebody that might have more experience than you not to be intimidated because they're going to elevate yeah. and the pros will have more fun teaching you and being nice to you than they will be taking a squash on you and it depends mm -hmm. on whether or not how you interact with them true very true i mean alex came in and did some grading how was that you're yeah. grading with an yeah, asc me and guy. alex they had a lot of fun actually Alex is one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He's a delightful guy. He really is. So on a on a on a note of that, you want to keep that approach in mind because you never know where those reach, right? So David has put out some amazing pictures as of late. He's got one called the yeah. Wonder 3D coming out. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Alex uh, is always working. But what blew me away is David sent me an email uh, the other day and sent me this link, and I'll show you guys why I'm freaking out and why we're excited. This is just a little <laughs> yeah. homage, and why I'm saying approach is important to maintain these relationships is because my boy Alex Waters and my boy David L. Snyder, my pals, me and Jeff's you friends, said Alex Waters, Alex Waters, Alex Funky, our <laughs> Alex Waters is my friend too. So is his brother Jeff. Yes. Uh, but our team, the, these these fellows that helped inspire me and were so patient with me as a director. All right, so I'm not going to play the whole thing because I don't want to uh, upset anyone. It's more an homage to Alex. So yeah. there, Alex Funky has now done the miniatures on Blade Runner, which now means that Jeff and I are one hug away from both Blade Runners. That is yeah. huge. I've now worked with huge. two members of major key members of Blade Runner. That's exciting, yeah. but that's the approach side. So again, reaching out to people above you helps elevate. Are you telling me the Blade Runner wasn't cinematic? Yes, it was ultra cinematic. I would define it as being both versions. Yeah. One of, collectively, the most cinematic concepts ever put down on paper visually yeah. that I've ever seen. I agree. And so now I've had a chance to work with both. Jeff has had a chance to work with both. Uh -huh. And my point is, is that it's their approach that made it work that way. It wasn't all about what lens. It wasn't about what frame yeah. size. It was about how they best tell a story. If you have a chance, watch the rest of that Blade Runner interview when you can. It's out there. Alex is just, you'll see, he's just... Like a, he's like a teacher. He's just a wonderful, wonderful teacher. It's like having the best college professor in the world. And Alex will share information like crazy. He's just yeah, a he really good guy that way. So um, as long as he wasn't too busy, yeah. As long as he, he would sit there and talk right. forever. Right. Uh, Alex is just a delight in that way. 
point being is that's what the cinematic really is. And so I just want to encourage anybody watching, whether it's someone who's two years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in, above you in experience, if it's someone below you and you get the call, maybe consider lending yourself out a little bit. I mean, yeah. obviously we all have to pay bills. Yeah, you still got to make the money. You still got to do it, but just consider the idea that you might actually have a cinematic value mm -hmm. that no one else has ever seen before. And I know we, we talk about Ichi and Sully a lot because we've seen their content a lot lately. Uh, Sailing Rewind had a great conversation, inspired some cinematic thought. He yeah. turned us on to some content that I had never did. considered before. So the, the idea of cinematic is, isn't just one idea. It's, this, this, it's, it's a state of mind about approaching your story with depth and character yeah. and concern for every aspect of the frame. Exactly. And Jeff agrees. I do. Do you concur, Doctor? I concur. <laughs> That's one of my favorite. That's <laughs> one of my favorite bits of all time. All right, so that's that <laughs> stuff. Um, I actually yeah. I, I tried to find a troll this week and I really didn't get one. Let me see if I can find this. I'll read it to you guys. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, uh, Jeff will answer some chat skis, But Okay, so this technically isn't a troll by any means. And so I'm saying this now. So this is not a troll. Uh, we did not have a BSTF moment. Uh, we've had plenty, and it was nice to have a relief from that, though they're really more fun to get onto the channel anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, we did not really have one. But, but I thought this particular fellow left a comment on probably one of our red versus gh5 videos that get us all the good troll stuff um that's like a net it's like casting a net it into is. troll land but he, he made some really great points and um and is very clear about it and, and very eloquent so i'm just gonna kick it over i didn't re respond yeah. i just thought it was a great point you, you know you could take it as bstf i don't because he clearly does not have a jerk yeah. face about it this is like a car making a video comparing a ferrari 488 to a volkswagen jetta no both cars will get you to your destination, but they serve vastly different purposes. Yeah, you made the GH5 look great, and it is a great camera. I own one and love it, but Hollywood films are shot on red. A red in the hands of a professional working for months on the footage will yield results that a GH5 can't, can't come anywhere close to. Disagree, but that's cool. This isn't a bash. I love the channel. Creativity and knowledge of the craft will always be more important than the gear, but I fear this kind of test causes amateurs to downplay the work of a professional camera op and believe their skill, skills are further ahead than they are. Which is a fantastic point that I I've often griped about. Yeah. yeah, we've griped about it before too. Which is the yeah. democracy of cinematography ha and and production has led to a series yes. of issues down the road. Yeah. However, um, I still disagree with what most people say about the the. Everyone just assumes because a red costs a certain amount of money yeah. that it means it's a cinema camera. It, that has nothing to do with. Well, that's it. me because most. Most movies that are shot red are usually very low budget. Mm -hmm. uh, That's the absolute they truth. Have almost, they do get some though. They get some big yeah, ones. I mean, the, the Hobbit Fincher movies uses were, a lot. The Fincher, Fincher uses you know, it, uh, but now but, he has a custom one, so it yeah. doesn't even really count. But most people don't use reds for features at all, really. On the bigger end, yeah, on the big side, yeah, ten plus million, yeah. Uh, you just don't see it as all much. Most of them go to Alexas or DXL, yeah. Panavision cameras, right? Um, which but is a complete different look. It is completely different, it, but he does have a point with the camera op. Yeah, thing. It it um, it's but that's the same thing I can say about post. But you know no, what? If yeah, we don't definitely. encourage those individuals to exactly. try and believe in themselves enough to jump off that cliff, mm -hmm. then we never get a new generation because exactly. we don't have the the world does not work the the working platform of the world does not work like it used to with apprenticeship. Yeah, it's gone. Mm -hmm. The concept of the apprenticeship does not really exist much anymore. It's exactly. hard to come by that. So either you're a, yeah. an abused intern, yeah, right, or you're uh, 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 unfortunately a harassed, a sexually harassed, or harassed of some other level individual uh -huh. trying to make your way, and the only way you deal with it is to put up with this harassment. It's very yeah. hard to have the old system built into place. Yeah, they've kind of killed that that point. They have. Um, I think you could still find it in certain budget sizes in Elena. No, I agree. Union, That's a good point. Union wise. That's a good point. Uh, or in the LA Union. Right. Stuff. But even in New Orleans Union stuff, though. I mean, right. we have one friend that, you know, has been running that old style quite a long time and has been lucky to be able to get through it that way. Right. But uh, so many people jump in way too early and don't do their apprentice. Right. Side of it. 
So yeah. There you go. Uh, what is the Panavision cameras they use for big budget? Well, the, I mean, they shoot film. We just were on a show with the, uh, uh, Panavision film cameras. Well, Panavision also does a DXL. It's an 8K. Uh, now has HDR capabilities to it. Uh, very large. Uh, it's their version of an Alexa, which does use red sensor technology. Yeah, so figure that one out. But it has light irons, color space. They so don't figure use, that out. Yeah, they now use there's three products mixed yeah. together. We're really four if you count Panty and cells. Yeah. Because the exactly. lenses you have to use for it are Panavision lenses. Yeah. It was Panavision 75. Four, that was for 70 millimeter film. So they're That's what they use for their right. lenses for that camera. Right. Can't buy it. Can only rent. You can only rent it out of Hollywood or if you are one of the big name directors around the country or around the world that could probably get it from Panavision. Right. We certainly can't get it. Right. Um, yeah, and that and, and uh, Trev brought up a good point about um, people have just chosen uh, camps and the level of fanboys. They do. You're right, but you know what a lot of it comes from is cost of investment. So mm -hmm. a lot of people assume that because uh, we're praising the GH5 that it's because we can't afford anything else. Well, as you guys know, like not bragging, but we do. We have three reds. But yeah. the fact is for us that we found a smaller camera that on a day-to-day -day operations level makes us as much money, if not more, from a cost operations level mm -hmm. than our GH5 does. Uh, than our, sorry, than our RED does. So yes. I have less work to set up a GH5, yeah. which means my labor time is lower, mm -hmm. which means our shooting time is maximized, which means our storytelling is focused on more, which means we reload less, which is a yeah. good and bad thing yeah. at the same time. Mostly bad for me. But it's great for interviews. Yeah, no, so absolutely. That's way better for, for red than yeah. our red for the interviews. Yes. So there's a whole lot of pluses for it for the type of content that is currently generating income for us. Um, and the argument on whether or not one is better than the other is silly. They're tools. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a screwdriver. I have some scissors. Can scissors uh, undo the bottom of a uh, of a plate? Yeah, yeah I can pop it, it off with that. But does this, does the nubby screwdriver, which by the way is a pro tip, if you find those they're gold, mm -hmm. does a nubby screwdriver do better? Hell oh yeah, yeah, it does all day long. So it's just different tools for different things. And I know we say that a lot on this show, but sometimes people mm -hmm. come across these videos and hopefully it inspires them. Yeah. Well, Max Digital brought up one uh, where he thought that Guardians 2 was shot on reds. It actually was. Yeah. Um, it is one of the bigger budget ones that have been. Uh, he's asking a couple questions, so I'm just going to go through a couple. Uh, other one is, which is the king of cameras then? The one you talked about now or the Ari? Uh, honestly... I would say an IMAX 70 millimeter. Yeah, I would, is the yeah. king camera yeah. uh, out Total there. Total anamorphic style. You yeah, uh, or a Panavision 65 millimeter film camera. But I mean, if you're putting it down to what's the king camera, I would say an Alexa, an Ari Alexa X, XL. Is the most used camera. It's probably the most used in, camera in that's cinema, out there on Hollywood yes. cinema level. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd put close next or the to it. With, the SXT also could be. The but new I put the Alexa Mini behind it from the Yeah, the Alexa side. Mini definitely is becoming one of the biggest ones. Because a lot of people like the Alexa Mini. It's like a red. Yeah. It's just a small brain operated yeah. sort of concept. Yes, yeah, so Christopher Nolan shot with both the uh, Alexa XT and the uh, IMAX camera both. He actually is one of the few people I've ever heard of that's broken an IMAX camera. Right. Um, I don't know. Uh, Trev, that's a great question. Trev's yeah. asking if there's a preference for brand by region. No, but I will tell you there is a preference for brand by agency, and that's one thing you've yes. come across. So the scary part about pushing yourself in one direction, whether we've done this right or wrong, I mean, mm -hmm. it could be hurting us now. To be honest with you guys, to be absolutely blatantly honest, the fact that our channel is so GH5 centric yeah. could be detrimental to me and Jeff's business. Yes. Because if someone be. has a red bias or a Alexa bias, and they think that all we shoot on is a $2,000 uh, camera and in their mind just like a Cuban cigar uh, mm -hmm. it's a better cigar because it's hard to get and a red is harder to get if that's what they think then that could be detrimental so there is that yes. part you always have to be conscious of what we try and do is never really align ourselves with one product or another yeah. except for when we feel that product is good enough to align ourselves which is right now we like the GH5 we're happy yeah. with it uh, we like our reds we're happy with those yeah. I like an Alexa I'm happy that, so yeah. I'll align it to whatever the story needs and what dictates the production. But yeah. but a lot of times if you tell everybody you constantly are shooting on red, you're constantly shooting on GH5, uh, sometimes telling people you're an owner-operator uh, of a certain brand of camera will be detrimental. Yep. 
It does. We've, we've lost jobs because we own Cine Primes. Yeah. We've lost jobs because we have a Red. Yeah. Because we own a Red, yeah. not an Alexa. That's correct. And they just wow. wanted a Mini, which is yeah. not really affordable, but somewhat affordable. Yeah. Um, so I think the region thing, yes. I think some places, I, in, I believe in China, the Red, the Red was very popular for a while. Yeah. It um, was. From conversations I had with other filmmakers, American filmmakers uh, that went over and shot films in China, mm -hmm. uh, the DP I was interviewing for another movie was saying that. So yeah. uh, I hope that answers it and, and gives you more mm -hmm. in, in that space. Uh, Impact asked a question about Baraka, and Ichi actually uh, did Baraka is the greatest film ever made. It is a custom Ari, Ari Flex. Uh, I can't remember what size film they shot on, but the Ari Flexes are the film cameras. Did, you, did I bring that up on the show, MPEG, or are you just a fan of Baraka? I think we have brought it up. Because I'm obsessed with it, and there's a sequel to it called yeah. Samsara, Samsara that you should watch as well. It's Samsara enough. is a little bit visually more pleasing to me than Baraka in portions. Yeah. Samsara's got a little bit cleaner image uh, out of the gate than than the other one does. Yeah, um, which was also shot on film as well. Right, yep. Um, they're very much what bigger people will call purist films. Right. Like the bigger side of the world, which would be film and not digital. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is no HDR version of it. Uh, I don't really think you need to see an HDR to yeah. me. It's just beautiful, just the way it is. Yep. Yeah. Uh, if I had, if cost, uh, MPEG asked if cost were no option, what would I shoot on? Film. All day. Yeah. All uh, day, if, every day. I actually, you have to change that to me. If cost and crew are no option. Shooting no, on but film. Cost, cost, you didn't get specified. I know. So if cost is no option, film. Yeah, I would do that. I'd shoot film all day. Yeah. I'd be thrilled. I would shoot film. BL35, just I drop would it actually, in my hands. Let me go. I personally would probably shoot an Alexa. Yeah, you're Over Alexa. Over a mini. Man. You like the Alexa. I do. Well, from an operator side, too, I mean, it's got the built-in shoulder. It's just like everything's built in perfectly. No, it's made for, for operators. Yeah, for it's sure. made perfectly that way. For sure. It's made for ACs. It's made for operators. It's, it's such a fun camera to shoot with. Unless you have to shoot in the water with it, then that's a whole different. Yeah, yeah. Don't like that camera. Okay, well, we should probably wrap it up. We I've got a call should. with a client that not a client, but maybe a client. I don't know. With maybe somebody we don't from, know. that's from the craft show community. That's a delightful human being that I uh -huh. love dearly. Now, um, we brought it heads at first, and now we figured out. Wait a second, we're just very similar fellows. Uh, anyway, I've got that yes. call. Me and Jeff need to do that. Um, that video, the 8K video, will drop. Uh, please check it out. It's pretty fascinating, and maybe you'll learn something about workflow you didn't know. Um, but it's kind of fun to see 8K, to see the resolution, especially the the anamorphic stuff. It looks yeah. phenomenal, and it's and it's interesting because we have two cave shots in there that uh, one of them's very low light, and the other one had to be eaten for noise for the actual thing. Yeah, and one's noise shot, one's a very low light shot. Yeah, and it's it. They're both, one of them is like a really simple shot, like low light wise, like yeah. as primitive as you can possibly mm -hmm. get in that space. So anyway, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to check us out every Tuesday if you're not. Most of the people here already are. Were you getting ready to say like, subscribe, and all the other yeah, stuff you say, say at the very end? Yeah. Uh -huh. But don't forget to uh, check out the video when it drops. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always shoot uh, emails to either one of us, Drew at CraftShow.com and Jeff at CraftShow.com. Yep. We're here to help uh, if you have questions. And we will drop the H-Star stuff. Thank you guys very much. Truly appreciate it. Very humbling yep. to have such a great community. Uh, let's talk about growing. Anybody's got any ideas for Small Batch Creative, the show? Really want to do those. MPEG, you had talked about one. Yeah. Really want to push them out. Um, that episode got built, the, the last uh, one. Yeah, and so the Ishii, it. Tom. Yeah, yeah, the combo. Combo thing the that Netherland was going on combo. there. Yeah. yeah, we want the Netherlands combo. Yeah. All right, thanks, everybody. Cheers. Yeah.